Hi everyone, welcome to today's People's Church service. We are so glad that you are here. And I want to encourage you, even as we start, put aside anything that might be distracting you and let's focus on God. We are here to meet Him. We're going to go into a time of worship and praise and singing songs to God. And I want to just encourage you right now. Let's just focus on Him. Let's focus on Him as we join the People's Church worship team. Let us pray.
let us adore the Lord this morning as we come together to give Him glory and praise. Oh, come let us adore Him. Oh, come let us adore Him. Oh, come let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus, you are worthy.
Oh, Lord. 
Our God is powerful and our God is worthy to be exalted. He is above every situation. He is the God of the impossible and He can do a miracle for you today. If you are right now with me praying together as we get into a time of prayer and you don't see a solution to the situation that you are in, you can't see a way through, there are challenges that you don't know how to get around. If that is your situation, I have good news for you today. Our God is able to do the impossible. His word says in Isaiah 26, 3, that He keeps in perfect peace those whose minds are focused on Him. Our God keeps in perfect peace those whose minds are focused on Him. Our peace does not come from our situation. Our peace does not come from our surroundings. Our peace comes from the God who knows and is able to do anything today. Would you pray with me? We are going to pray for our country and our leaders, but we are also going to take some time to pray for the different situations and the needs that we have. Would you join your faith with me? If you feel comfortable, close your eyes. Let's focus on our God. Let's focus on Him and let us pray. God, I come to you together with my brothers and sisters. I join my faith in you. Lord, I join my faith with them in you. Lord, we believe in you. We, we join our faith together and we just say, God, God, we believe in you. We believe and we acknowledge that you are our provider. Lord, that you are our healer. That you are able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ask or imagine. That is the God we serve. And right now, I just pray, Lord, for every bit of fear that is in us, Lord, the spirit of fear that is coming into our home sometimes because of this pandemic, Lord. The anxiety that we feel because we don't know what is going to happen in the future. I pray, pray against it in Jesus' name. God, you are not a God of fear and anxiety. And we pray against it in Jesus' name. And we just pray, Lord, peace over our homes. 
Lord, where there is need, especially financial need coming out of this pandemic. I just pray, Lord, that you will reach out your hand and that you would provide. Lord, you own everything and we just trust, God, that you are able to do exceedingly and abundantly. We just ask, Lord, that you will provide for everyone in our church family, everyone who is listening today, who is in need, God, stretch out your hand and do a miracle for them, I pray. Especially, Lord, for everyone who is sick, whether it's us or whether it's someone we love or know, we just pray, Lord, for miracles across the board. God, I have seen you do so many amazing things, so many healings that have just blown my mind. And I just pray, God, that you will do it again. Those things that we've heard in the Bible that were amazing, Lord, that you would do it again. That we would have stories that we can share with people who don't know you about the miracles that you have performed. Lord, do amazing miracles, Lord. Heal and heal spectacularly, I pray. God, we pray finally for our nation. God, in such a trying and challenging time, I just pray, God, that you would speak to our leaders and our government. Give them discernment and wisdom beyond any human capability and capacity. Lord, help them to make decisions that are so finely tuned, Lord. Bring them unity, Lord, so that they can make decisions together. Lord, protect those people in government. Protect their health and bless them, I pray. I just pray, Lord, that you will protect everyone who are first responders, the doctors, the people in the army, people in public service who are looking after us in this pandemic. Lord, bless them, I pray. Lord, we come together as a nation and we pray, Lord, that there will be breakthrough and healing and coming back to a sense of normalcy again. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I am Basil Spellman from Kotena. I am the eldest child in my family and I have two younger brothers. We used to live in Colombo but later moved to India during the ethnic conflict. When I was just 13 years old, my dad suddenly fell ill and was paralyzed due to rheumatoid arthritis. So I had no choice but to take on the responsibility of providing for our family which included taking care of all living and medical expenses and educating myself and my two brothers as well. My dad had a small printing press which appeared to be the only livelihood and the only source of income I could think of due during that difficult time. So I went to the printing press and began my work by trying to complete a small printing order which had been take, undertaken by my dad. I still do not know how I really learned composing and printing but I somehow started work. Looking back, I know it is because I believe in God and I had faith that God will help me. I used to get up early in the morning at 4 and go to the printing press for work and thereafter go to school by 8 a.m. After school, in the evening, I went about with client visits towards securing printing jobs. This was my daily routine in pursuit of making a living. We were studying at a private school and when the management sent us out for not paying the school fees, I would go directly to the school office and get printing orders and pay the fees for the three of us. God helped me through an order with an advance payment to pay the school fees. This is how I completed my studies. During those early days, there were times that we experienced hunger. I still remember a day when I bought 10 kg of ration rice and was riding a bicycle with a bag of rice tied behind. I was happily singing songs as I cycled home, but to my dismay, I found an empty bag. The rice was missing. I was crying and went back, only to find that all the rice had split on the road. So I had to gather the rice, which was spilled over a muddy road, take it home to be cleaned and cooked. My prayers for one whole year focused just on asking God for three meals a day for all five of us. We finally completed our education and graduated from university. I graduated from one of the leading university in India and excelled in the field of economics. I am grateful to our God for the honor of being awarded a gold medal in economics from the Tamil Nadu governor in the presence of Dr. APG Abdul Kalam a former president of India. Therefore, God gave me many opportunity to work for a top corporates in India and in Sri Lanka. I worked in many industries and acquired a wealth of knowledge in different spheres. In 2008, 
a friend took me to a church i experienced peace and had a fresh encounter with the holy spirit that day thereafter i came to people church where i started reading and meditating on god's word more intensely and during this time i gained a clear clearer understanding about the kingdom principles my calling and god's purpose for my life God has blessed me with a wonderful family of my own and with abundance of supply which has been my prayer for many years especially during those years of hardships he has made me to become a testimony to proclaim that God is faithful and his grace is sufficient for all of us all glory to Jesus amen upon the hill on calvary from heaven's throne a fallen ness and mercy meet where blood and water flow what grace divine what selflessness that Christ would bear Last week, we started a very practical and down to earth series called Just Grow Up from the book of James. You know, James was written by the stepbrother of Jesus who actually did not become a follower of Christ until after the resurrection. You know, till then he had his own doubts maybe. But after the resurrection of Christ, he became a believer and a follower. It is a very short book. at the the end of the new testament it's about i think five yeah it is not i think i know it is five chapters long uh, it has 108 verses uh, but it's jam packed with practical advice and it talks mainly about maturity maturity and also the lack of it i am hoping that the word of god will make you strong mature and will make you grow you're never too old to just grow up so let's pray and ask god's blessing father we come to you and we ask you lord that you will speak to our hearts from your word but more than speaking that we would be able to change according to your word lord we know that you don't want babies who are spiritually going about and crying and grumbling but you want us to grow up and be mature 
Speak to us and change us. Let Dishan decrease and the Holy Spirit increase. In Jesus name. Amen. Today I want us to look at what I am calling tempering temptation. Tempering temptation. You know, we will look at James 1 verses 12 to 15 today on what God has to say about man's oldest problem. And what is man's oldest problem? Temptation. You know, this problem goes all the way back to Adam. You know, we all eventually, we face it. Sometimes, even when you know what's right to do, it's difficult to say no. You know, someone said this, the only way to get rid of temptation is to give in to it. Now, that's not right. That's not the right way, right? I guess um, that was a funny way of trying to uh, get over it. Temptation is always a distraction. It's a distraction to do something worse than something better. It is to do something wrong than to do something right. You're never tempted uh, unless it is wrong. You know, you, you're not tempted, oh, I got tempted to pray. I got tempted to give somebody a donation. No, you're always tempted to do the wrong thing, right? James 1.12 uh, says this, James 1.12, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. The Bible talks about two different kinds of testing. Now one is called trials and the other is called temptation. Both of them use the same word in Greek, which is, uh, which is pirasmos, pirasmos, right? Sometimes pirasmos is translated as trials and sometimes as temptations. It doesn't matter because sometimes a situation can be both a trial and a temptation. But to distinguish them, I want to tell you that trials are situations designed by God in order to help us grow. While temptations are designed by the devil in order to cause us to sin. Let's look at three aspects of tempering temptation. The first one, the first one is how to handle temptation. How do you handle temptation? How do I say no when I want to say yes? James being the practical apostle, he gives us three ways of handling temptation, right? The first one is be realistic, be realistic. Face the fact, you will be tempted. Everyone is tempted. All of us are tempted. In James 1.13 it says, And remember, when you are being tempted. Now note here, it doesn't say uh, uh, if you are being. No, it says when. Right? It's just like trials, temptations are also inevitable. Have you ever met a pious person who comes and says, I thank God, I have never been tempted in 42 years. You know, that's what you get when you cross a pig and a washing machine. That's called a bunch of hogwash, bunch of rubbish. There is nothing like that. Everybody is tempted. You're tempted, I'm tempted, every day we are tempted. You never get too old for it. You never overcome it by getting too spiritual. Everybody is tempted. The more you grow in the Lord, the more you're going to be tempted. It's a fact of life. Reality is all of us are tempted. Even Jesus was tempted. And he faced the three temptations. You see, there is a misconception that says... You know, once you get close to Christ, you got it all together. You've arrived, so you can fake it and wear a mask and pretend like, how could anybody do something like that? I want to tell you, we are all tempted. Friends, this is not what I am saying. This is what the word of God is saying. In 1 Corinthians 10.13, it says this, The temptations in your life, are no different from what others experience. That means we are all in the same boat. We all have the same temptations, the same problems. 
So don't be surprised. Don't be shocked. Don't try to hide it. Some of you may be in a compromising situation even right now, facing temptation. But it's liberating to know that we all have similar temptations. We all have similar problems. Listen to me. It is not a sin to be tempted. It is not a sin to be tempted. But it is a sin to give in to temptation. Hebrews 4.15 Hebrews 4.15 says this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way. Just as we are. Yet he did not sin. You see he was perfect. He was tempted, but he never gave in. You know, I meet a lot of people who are intimidated by temptation. They can, oh, uh, how could I have thought such a thought? My friend, the devil put it in your mind. It's not your fault. He's the tempter. You are human. I am human. Temptation proves that, that we are human, but not that we are evil. You see, it's not a sin to be tempted, but it is a sin to give in to temptation. The second thing is be responsible. Be responsible. Accept responsibility. Don't blame other people for your problems. You know we love to blame people. Even we love to blame God. James 1.13 James 1.13 says this And remember when you are being tempted do not say God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong and he never tempts anyone else. God does not tempt but we love to blame others. You know stop passing the ball or passing the buck. We are in a society of irresponsibility. You know blame society, blame the government, blame the environment, blame, the, uh, blame our heredity or blame your parents, bl blame your spouse. Blame the devil, blame the church, blame the pastor, and even blame God. Some people say, it must be God's will or he wouldn't have let it happen. You know, that's called blaming God. I heard of a person who told their pastor, Pastor, God told me to leave my wife and go and marry someone else that I met at church. Friend, that's called blaming God. Don't make your bad choices and then blame them on God. God does not tempt. He never contradicts his word. God is not going to tell you one thing and have the word of God, the Bible, say something different. If the Bible says something and you say something different, guess what? You are wrong. Be responsible. Don't blame God and don't blame other people. It's a sign of of immaturity. It's time to grow up. And then thirdly, be ready. Be ready. When temptation comes, be ready. Be prepared for it. Peter says, be on your guard. Jesus says, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. And then Paul the apostle, he says, Put on the whole armor of God. Be ready. Be prepared. And then James 1.14. James 1.14 says, Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. You see, we need to be ready and prepared for temptation. Temptation does not uh, uh, warn you in advance. You see, uh, one of the reasons it's called temptation is because you don't even know it's there. You see, it catches you by surprise. You got to be ready and on your guard. We are most vulnerable after a tremendous victory and success. You know, when we are high up, then we are vulnerable. 1 Corinthians 10.12 1 Corinthians 10.12 says, If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. You know, I think of this story uh, I read of uh, Bobby Leach. Bobby Leach, uh, he 
went over the Niagara Falls in a barrel. He, he went from the US side to the Canadian side in, in, in a barrel and he was the second person to do that and he uh, went to the other side and he came out completely unharmed. A short while later, Bobby Leach slipped on an orange peel and broke his leg and that led later to his death. You see, it's the little things in life that kill us. James is saying, be ready. Don't be deceived. How do you prepare for temptation? How do you get ready for it? By understanding how it operates. So, my next point is how temptation works. How temptation works. God wants you to know how the devil operates. How he tempts. The only thing you can say about the devil that's good is this. You know what? He is consistent. He's been using the same old bag of tricks for 2,000 plus years and longer. 2,000 plus years, same old tricks. You know, in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, it says this, So that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. It's very easy to discover Satan's process. Temptation is a process. Never just a one-time act. You know, there are actually four steps that are used to tempt us. Right? There are four steps that are used to tempt you. And I would like to look at this um, in the four Ds used by the enemy to tempt us. That's taken from this portion of scripture. The first one, the first D is desire. Desire. James 1.14, the first part of the verse says, Temptation comes from our own desires. The first step of temptation is desire. It's an inside job. Most desires are okay. You know, you couldn't live without desire. A desire to eat, drink, sleep. The sexual desire to accomplish, you know. Uh, God gives us these desires. Those are good desires. They are good gifts. But any desire out of control becomes destructive. Now Satan loves to take routine desires and turn them into runaway desires. When you are consumed and obsessed by food, work, having fun, sex and, and money, you see, then they become a problem. If it wasn't for the inward desire, you wouldn't be tempted. It starts off on the inside. Temptation always starts with a desire. And then it goes to the next D, which is deception. Deception. James 1.14, the second part of the verse, says temptation comes to entice us and drag us away. James uses a couple of terms from the sports world. The term drag away is a hunter's term which literally means snared in a trap. The term entice is a fisherman's term, which means entice by bait. You see, the, the, the secret of great fishing is in the bait. The, 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 the right kind of bait for the right kind of fish. How many fish will you catch with a bare hook and no bait? You got to put bait on it. And the right kind of bait for the right kind of fish. You see, what kind of bait does the devil use on you? He knows your hot button or which buttons to press. He knows what gets you going. He knows your weaknesses. He knows you inside and out. He knows what turns you on. He knows what you will fall for. Whether it be lust or money or position or power or greed. He knows. He hides his hook in his bait. And the bait appeals to your weakness. You see, the, grace, the crazy thing is that often we see the hook and we know it's temptation, but we still keep right on nibbling. You know, when people tell me, oh, back off, I know what I'm doing, or I'm an adult, I know how far to go, I know that person is dangerously 
going from desire to deception. And my friends, desire to deception and the third D is next. It's called disobedience. Disobedience. James 1.15. James 1.15, the first part of that verse says, These desires give birth to sinful actions. What begins in your mind and starts in your imagination results in an action. The battle starts with your thoughts. It moves from your thoughts into actions. First the devil gets your attention and then he gets you to have an attitude. And then he gets you to commit the action. He knows if he can get your attention, he will eventually get you to disobey and commit sin. Oh, people say, what's the danger in a harmless fantasy? Or what's the danger in soft porn? Or, or you know, it doesn't hurt anybody. I want to tell you what starts in your mind eventually comes out in your life. It always begins in the imagination. Friend, listen to me. What you flirt with, you will fall for. That's the whole purpose. You know, if you look at TV and, and internet advertising, Right? That's the purpose. They try to get you to imagine something. They know if they can get your imagination, they've got you. If that didn't work, nobody would advertise. The Bible says that what starts in your mind eventually comes out in your lifestyle. So, from desire to deception to disobedience. And then to the final D we move into is called death. Death. James 1.15, the last part of the verse says, And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. That's the tragic consequence of giving in. That's what losing the battle causes devastating results. What is death? It's physical death through, but it's, it, it's also the exact opposite of living. If you overcome temptation, you get the crown of life. But the Bible also says the wages of sin is death. You see, it is a spiritual and eternal separation from God. James says we are free to choose the way we want to live. I could choose any way I want to live and so can you. But listen to me. But you are not free to choose the consequences of those choices. I am free to have my kicks, but I am not free to eliminate the kickbacks. The final major point I want to bring to you is how to defeat temptation. How to defeat temptation. You see, if temptation begins with our inner thoughts, then defeating temptation comes by changing our thoughts. It starts with your thoughts and then you win also by changing your thoughts. We need to change the way we think. Romans 12, 21. Romans 12, 21 says, Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. You see, this is the principle of replacement and is the key to overcoming temptation. The key to overcoming temptation is not to just try resisting it, but to simply refocus your thoughts. Change your attention. Refocus. Replacement. You know, when you're tempted with one thing, replace it with something else. Philippians 4.8. Philippians 4.8 says, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise friend focus your mind on the goodness of god why 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 because the more you fight a feeling the more it grabs you don't focus on what you should not do but on what you should be doing now when you have a temptation you can't stop satan from putting thoughts in your mind. But you know what? What you can do is, you can reject those thoughts and change your mind. Martin Luther, Martin Luther said this, he says, you can't stop 
a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop it from making a nest in your hair. When temptation calls you, drop the receiver and forget it. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. You see, when you refocus, it may mean physically removing yourself from the situation. If you don't want to get stung, my friend, get away from the bees. Maybe you need to change the channel on the TV. Maybe you need to get off the internet. Maybe you need to walk out of that movie. I don't know what it is, but maybe you need to change your job because the temptation is at work. Maybe you need to change the office van ride. You see, Joseph was in a tempting situation and he left his clothes and he ran away at once. Don't think that temptation is overpowering and you have no control and, and you're lost and, and you're finished. No. The word of God says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can stand up under it. What a great promise. God never puts more on you. He never allows more on you than he puts in you to bear it up. You see, when you get a thought from God, it's called inspiration. When you get a thought from the devil, it's called temptation. And I want you to know that God says that there is a way of escape. When temptation comes, there is a way. When God says it, it's there. Look for that way of escape. Find that way of escape. Because God is going to honor you, reward you and lift you up. I want to close with this verse in James 1.12. James 1.12, this is promises for you. Listen to me. God says, God blesses those who patiently end your testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. That, my friend, is the reward. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Please don't look around. I know many have dealt with temptation, are dealing with it and will face it soon. But you know, look at the word of God. James has given you a clear path. And you know, one thing I just want to re-emphasize is, how do you beat temptation? You, you, as you close your eyes, please don't walk around, don't talk. Just take a moment because I want to tell you, even in your family, right where you are, you, you, you may not know what the other person is going through. Let God deal with this. You see, you replace the temptation with a godly thought, with what God is going to drop in. You replace it, you refocus, you change the way you think. Father, I bring my brother, I bring my sister, I bring everyone listening today to this message from your word. That Lord, even as temptation comes their way, they won't just give in to it, won't let the devil come and, and, and build a nest in their life and mess it up. But I pray that you will help them to resist and you will help them to refocus, rethink and replace. And Lord, to walk out in strength, knowing that you are with them. Lord, help each one to have their temptations well tempered and taken care of so that you may dwell in their lives and you'll take control and they may be what you want them to be. We commit each and every one into your loving hands. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. What an insightful sermon from God's Word that Pastor Dishan just taught us. But I want to remind you today that insight is not just so that we can keep it in our heads, but it's insight is supposed to be lived out. Let me encourage you that we should be people who don't just hear God's Word, but live it out, who act on God's Word. Have a great week and live out God's Word. See you soon.